one of the things that we have learned in the last six months is that the church is not a building. Now, I love the fact that we can meet at this particular location, but the church is the people of God. It's not defined or limited by one denomination, although it includes the denominations, but we are composed of this wonderful kind of mystical uh, people of God from every tribe, nation, and tongue, the Bible says. And we are a part of this great mission that God has given us. And I remember one time years ago, we had a young couple that were serving at the church with our youth and they felt led to go to another congregation. And so I said, uh, you're just not going to leave before you leave. We're going to bless you. We're going to hold We're going to thank you. And all the young people, youth got together and uh, we had a cake and we had coffee and, and hot chocolate for the kids. And uh, I just, and the kids were really sad and every young person prayed for them. It was such a wonderful blessing. They were really quite moved about it. And I just said this, they're not leaving our church. They're only leaving our congregation. You see, you can't leave our church. You can't because there's only one church. You can not stop coming here, but that's not leaving the church. Now, I want to emphasize that we're all, all true believers in Jesus are part of the body of Christ, which is, which is, is the church. But there's only one church, and we're, there is only one people of God. And when I find that people leave the church, I pray blessing on them. Leave me our congregation, that is, you know what I mean by that. Uh, it's important because we affirm one another. It's love that binds us together. People leave for different reasons. So I pray that when people leave, it's because God's leading them. When I know that God is leading people elsewhere, I rejoice because that means we've impacted people and we're sending them out. And that's what we should be doing. We should be affirming and releasing and helping and encouraging. I'll tell you what we should not be doing, especially as leadership. We're not here to control people. We're not here to micromanage them, but we do need to encourage them. Accountability is not control, it's safety. Because when we know what people are doing, then we're able to help guide them. And by the way, it's okay to have minor points of differences. I think it's healthy. We're all growing and we're all learning. On the essentials, they're non-negotiables. That is who Jesus is and what he has done for us, our, our faith, uh, the word of God. I believe our moral values that are outlined in the Bible are non-negotiable. There's no negotiations. I won't get into all the details, but I'm saying there are actually relatively few really absolutes, but those absolutes are not, you can't move them. They're absolutely non-negotiable. But within those things, there's room and freedom to grow. And sometimes I find, even if I disagree with someone else in the body of Jesus, the fact that we can dialogue respectfully and lovely, it helps us grow. See, the point isn't for me or someone else to win the argument. It's to understand what the truth is. And if I'm not following the truth, or maybe I have the truth, but I can understand it more clearly by another perspective, it stretches me. And the Bible says that as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens each other. That doesn't mean conflict. It means it makes me better. It makes me sharper. I have a lot of friends that make me better, and I'm so grateful for that. I was talking to Leonard yesterday, and, and I just said to Leonard, Leonard, you really helped me. I said, you sharpened me. You know, you really do. You help me understand things better. And when I'm wrestling through things that I don't understand, isn't it great? That's why we have the body of Jesus. We have one another. You don't have to do your faith alone. In fact, you were never designed to. The whole idea of a lone ranger Christianity is not biblical. In fact, you were created to be a part of. And the Bible uses the analogy of the body. And we all have different parts to play. What I'm doing up here today is actually really the smallest thing. What you do out there and what I equip you to do is the big thing. So the fivefold ministry is the Bible lines, the apostle, prophet, uh, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are to equip the body to the new work of the ministry. So the work of the ministry is done through you. That's the big part because you're going to reach people I can't reach. So uh, it's not like a football game where there's, you know, I don't know how many people play football, 22 people who desperately need rest, watched by 50,000 people who desperately need exercise, right? <laughs> the body of Christ is we're all in this together. And I want to talk about building God's kingdom. And I want to start off with the very one 
who built God's kingdom and who it's all about, we should never lose focus, is Jesus. In anything and everything that you find yourself doing in ministry, never lose the focus. So some people are called to helping the poor, and that's wonderful. But don't lose your focus that you're doing it for Jesus' sake. It's all about the kingdom, and there's many different ministries, too many to mention, but all of them good. And God will express his gifts through your personality, through the way he's called you, through uh, so many different ways. And even evangelism is, is done in so many ways. Teaching is done in so many ways. So um, God is creative, and he expresses himself beautifully through you. But imagine for a moment, I want to take you back 2,000 years. And we've been, my wife have been to this place in modern Israel today. It's called Banyas. But in those days, it was called Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus is having a private conversation with his disciples. Wouldn't you want to be a part of that? Can you imagine Jesus saying, I want you to come with me. I want to take you away. And I want to speak to your hearts privately without the rest of the crowds. That's where I want to take you today. And we are so privileged because... God has given us his word, the Bible, so that we can actually have that very experience. And this morning, I trust that God will speak to you in the same way, even through his word. But because we have his spirit, God can draw you into that same sense of intimacy that he drew his early disciples. And let's take a look at the scripture, Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Because he had not yet gone to the cross. But guess what? Jesus has gone to the cross and raised from the dead. And now we can tell others about this wonderful message. Um, when Diane and I visited uh, Caesarea Philippi called the Banyas, it's still there. And it's interesting that Jesus would take his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. It's in the north. It's at the foot of the Mount Hermon. And it was actually the capital of paganism. It was named after Herod Philip, who was one of King Herod's sons. And it was the capital of paganism at that place. And they worshipped the god Pan. I don't know if you've ever heard of the god Pan. Pan actually comes from the Greek word to mean all or universal. And that's where we get our Pan American games. Pan means all. And so often we use that in modern English. And he was a half goat, half man. He had horns like a goat. He had legs and feet like a goat, but the torso of a man. And he was quite a capricious God. And he represented the universal God of paganism. And so there is, uh, they have found the grottos. They have found uh, the caves where they worshipped him in Caesarea Philippi. And there was a temple that once stood there. And there's a stream that runs from the Hermon Mountains. And that's the place where they believe the place of the underworld or the place of the dead went. And what the place of the dead in Greek was Hades, by the way. And they used to call that place the gates of Hades. Jesus didn't take him to Jerusalem. You would have thought this Jewish man, the, uh, the Messiah, would reveal himself to his brothers in Jerusalem at the temple site. The head of Judaism and saying he should have gone to the temple and say, here I am, I'm the, I'm the fulfillment of Judaism. But he didn't do that. He took them secretly to the, actually the place that was the capital of paganism, and probably it says the regions of Caesarea Philippi. He might not have gone there because it was a pagan site, but he went to that region of Caesarea Philippi. And it's there that he revealed his Messiahship because he's giving us a clue. And that clue is that we are taking this faith and we are going to take it to the nations. 
We're going to take it to the nations. And the very first question he asked, and this is amazing, 2,000 years later, we asked the same question, who is Jesus? It's amazing if you were to survey people and ask them, who is Jesus? It'd be amazing the answers you get today. Some people will say, well, he was a good man. Other people say he was mythological. He didn't exist. Other people will say that Jesus uh, was uh, a prophet or a great teacher or a great rabbi. But you know, all of those definitions, even some of them sound good, fall short of who he is. And I want to tell you one thing. This is the most important question that of all time. All time and eternity actually rests on this one question. Because if you get this one wrong, it's the difference between heaven and hell. You don't know who Jesus is. You've missed the boat. It's all about him. It's all culminates, It's all coming to the head. And he takes his disciples to this capital of paganism where they worship the god Pan. And it's very interesting. This god Pan uh, was actually very capricious. In other words, he was very moody. He was unstable. And it's in a rocky area. And he was a shepherd god. And so the, as, the, as the shepherds brought their sheep, sometimes rocks would fall. And they thought it was god Pan angry with them, throwing rocks down on them. And that's where they get that, the, the fear of, they actually had a term called the fear of Pan, panikeion, where we get our word panic from. Isn't that interesting? What does the Bible say? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And so here is Jesus taking his disciples, saying, who do men say to him? And all of those answers, by the way, wrong. And then he turned to Peter and turned to his disciples. He says, but who do you say I am? Isn't that interesting? And Peter, just as impulsive Peter would be, blurted it out. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Right answer. Very interesting what Jesus said to him, and it still speaks to us today. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. I want you to know this morning, if you know Jesus personally, you didn't come upon that conclusion on your own basis. If you have a real relationship with Jesus, the revelation of Jesus can only come through the Spirit of God. I hear Christians who have said to me, I never hear from God. Well, I said, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? And they said, yes. Do you believe in him? Yes. Do you have a relationship with him? Yes. But I just don't hear him. They expect something. I said, well, you actually have heard from God. What's it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? One says, no one can call Jesus Lord except through the Holy Spirit. So I want you to know, if you, if you know Jesus this morning, you've heard from God. And it was not flesh and blood that revealed that to you, but our Father in heaven. And aren't you glad about that this morning? That we have heard from God. And, uh, and he said, you're blessed. Kind of funny. It was, it was not a rebuke, but it was kind of like, Peter, you couldn't even get that one right. You need Jesus. And I want to tell you, I'm so glad I can't get things right. I depend on the Lord for everything. But he says, uh, flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father who is never. And I tell you, Peter, this is a really important point. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, he wasn't talking that Peter was the rock, by the way. Because in the Greek, and if you look up the Greek, Peter means little rock or stone. And he says, on this Petra, that's the big rock. Jesus was speaking about himself. The foundation, Christ is our foundation stone. And the foundation stone is is Christ and this belief that he is and understand that he is the son of God. It starts off with who Jesus is. Now he says, don't reveal this yet because he hadn't finished the work. He had to go to the cross and die for the sins of the nation and be raised from the dead. That was the completing work that had not yet happened. But the foundation is who is Jesus. And everything that we do is built on that foundation of the knowledge of Christ, his person and his work. And then he says something interesting. He says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Very interesting language. Gates are not attacking instruments. They're defending instruments. It's the church that is attacking the gates of hell. And the place where Jesus, in that region of Caesarea Philippi, where they worshipped the pagan god Pan, this capricious god, this angry god, 
He's contrasting it. Instead of angry, I'm building a foundation on the person of Christ. That foundation is love. That foundation is security. That foundation is peace. That foundation is solid. It's not instability. It means whatever you go through, whatever you're facing, I don't care if it's COVID, it shall not prevail. I don't care if it's persecution, it shall not prevail. I don't, if it's secularism or a hostile society, we are living in a more hostile society against Christianity now than ever. And we are going to have to take out, we are not to accommodate culture, we're to confront culture. We're to confront culture with the truth, not with hostility, but with love. But we cannot compromise the very things that are the foundation of our faith. We cannot agree with society in their moral views. We cannot. We have to hold fast to the views that we hold. It's just that we don't condemn them for their views because we have a greater message. But it's important to hold the ground. And I'm concerned that in the Western church, at least, we're dropping the guard on our moral views. And we need to raise the banner, not to be legalistic, but to be holy. God's called us to holiness. God's called us to holiness. It's a hard standard. But thank God we're under grace. We can repent. And it's an ongoing process. It's a lifelong process of becoming more like Jesus so that the world may know. That's what we're here for. It's one bottom line. It's about who is Jesus and about sharing that message. And so uh, the gates of hell will not prevail. They're not going to prevail in difficulties. Do you want to know something interesting? Statistically, and I've looked at this. I, won't, I don't want to bore you with numbers and all that, but I accept it as a principle. The church from the first century till today has never shrunk. It's always grown. Now, it's grown sometimes in different places. It's sometimes waxed and waned. Some areas like Western Europe and in, in the West in general, Christianity has declined, although God is renewing his people. But I'll tell you, this is Christ's church. He is building it. He is using people, but this is not my church. It's his church. We have to be stewards of it by the grace of God, but this is not my church. And so we are responsible to under the lordship of Christ. He's the head. He's the rock, but he's going to do it with you or without you. I prefer to do it with us. Don't you? Don't you want to be a part of what God's doing? I do. But he is building his church because he is faithful. What we want to do is we want to be surrendering to the head, the lordship of Christ. You know, when the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Lord and confess him, you know, what does it say? If you believe in your heart that... And confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Thank you. Sorry, I was just having a moment. Um, that Jesus is Lord. Do you know those words were not flippant? Like, lordship, if you confess Christ as Lord in the days of the Roman Empire, it could mean you lose your life. Who knows today? Like, thank God we have our freedoms today. If one thing I've learned about the social isolation, the church is going on. God has given us strategic ways, but we need each other. We still need to connect. We are still working on, we're talking about small groups. We've got to keep them under 10 right now, but we want people to connect. And if you can't connect, call one another and pray for another and call the church and call your friends. We're all the church. It's like, it's not one person's job. It's all of us to connect, encourage one another. That's what the church is. And uh, we are using Zoom. And if you want to be part of a, a Zoom small group ministry, please call the church tomorrow, 519-438-6005. Or email us at odcf at odcf.ca. That's enough for the commercial. But we can still connect. God has given us truth. Thank God we can meet this morning. Isn't it wonderful? But we are not limited by a building. In fact, God's not limited by anything. In that where the church has been persecuted has seen the most growth. We have some friends who are missionaries to Iran. They're Iranian former Muslim believers in Christ now. I can't mention their names. Because they could, even in Canada, could be in danger. Uh, they kill Muslims in Iran. There's apostasy laws. They kill Muslims that become Christians. I don't know if you're aware of that. In the modern world, people are dying for confessing Christ as Lord. So that statement is not just a flippant confession. It is a very core issue here. And who knows when Christianity could become illegal in Canada. I don't want us to be caught flat-footed. I want to use this time in COVID where we've had to redefine how we meet as a church, how we connect as a church to strengthen the church. If it became illegal today and they shut all the buildings down, I would love us to not skip a beat. And we can only do that if we connect relationships. And there's two ways that I see that we can connect. 
One is small groups. Not everybody works well with a small group, and there's lots of reasons why, and by the way, that's okay. What I want to do is have people who are uh, appointed by the church to call people, have a list of people that they call every week or two on an appointed time. How are you? We're praying for you. Pray for them. Give them a scripture verse and find out how they're doing. And let us know as a church how we can help. How's that sound? So that I want everybody, this is my ideal. We're not there yet, but we are working on it. Everybody needs to be pastored. Everybody needs to know they belong, that there's meaning in relationship. And we can't do it alone. I can't touch base with three or 400 people. I, there's just not enough of me. I'm not that good. Thank you. I see a lot of agreement here. So, um, but that doesn't mean God doesn't have a choice. So we are praying, live streaming, and thanks Derek and all the team that have worked together for uh, putting together. We are improving, and we're going to be improving our facility and our sanctuary so people can live stream. I am so passionate about our youth and young adults uh, so much. They are so important. I'm also passionate about the seniors because I'm in that category, okay? So don't feel neglected. But our young adults are the next generation. This is the time. As you'll notice, uh, the, over the past couple of months, I have been introducing some of our young adults and they have been sharing the word of God. Aren't they wonderful? Aren't you so glad? And this is gonna continue because we need to empower them. They are the next, they're not the next generation. You're at the generation of the now and we're so grateful for all of you. But the pulpit ministry is only one area. There's so many other areas where we can serve and uh, how we can connect with one another. So God is building his kingdom and it shall not prevail. I wanna tell you an interesting fact. Where the church has been persecuted, it has the most growth. So I was mentioning Iran, they figure in 1979, when there was the culture, there was the revolution in Iran where uh, the Islamic um, Sharia law became the law and everything was shut down and, and Christians were persecuted. They went from around 15,000 known evangelical believers to today, there's several million and they can't count them, there's so many. That usually doesn't happen, does it? But you see, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire to put it out. It doesn't put it out, it fans it. Now, I don't pray for persecution. I don't pray that, well, I pray that we can, the Bible says work while it's called today for night comes when no man can work. I pray that we will use the time we have now. But should there come a time that Christianity becomes illegal, they shut the churches down, we should operate and function even without a building because we are mobilized and connected. That's what we want. And we want people mature and trained and kept well in Christ. And we're also here for your protection. Not for control, but for protection. There's a big difference, isn't there? Anyways, um, so the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And by the way, uh, from the time that Jesus made this proclamation of, of his messiahship, he was actually proclaiming to the pagan world, he says, your time has come. Do you know that within 300 years, uh, the Roman Air Empire became Christianized? It became basically the official religion of the Roman Empire. That's how powerful. The early church, with all the persecution, you know, there was 10 major persecutions from Nero to Diocletian, and the attempt was to wipe out the church through fear, through intimidation, through persecutions. They used to feed Christians to the lions. They used to burn them at the stakes. Um, they, uh, Nero even burned Rome in order to blame it on the Christians, and persecution grew out the Christians. Do you know that all of the early apostles uh, except for maybe John, died as martyrs because of their faith. And yet look what happened to the, to the globe because God is in control. You can kill my body, but you cannot kill the work of the Holy Spirit. And I think there's a message for us today, no matter what we are going through. And if you look around and seeing uh, the church and, and sometimes there's some dysfunctional things, God is still in control and God is building his church. And I'm so grateful for it. It's because of who Christ is. And then he says, and he finishes off, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And there's many uh, thoughts about what that means. But I'll tell you my basic thought. The key to the kingdom is faith in Jesus Christ. That's the key to the kingdom. There's probably other keys I haven't done. And he doesn't say what they are. I believe there's many different things that we have to, to walk through. But if we focus on the one key, and the one key is this, that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he rose from the dead. And as we repent of our sins and turn to him in faith, that's the foundation. That's the rock that no one can take away from you. That's the foundation. And our lives should be governed 
by that principle is that it's Christ first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. And everything we do, our lives should be governed by the principle of seeking God first. We're trying to do that at Open Door as, as your pastors and, and leadership team here. We're trying to do the best to grow the kingdom of God, to go to the next level. We're trying to be so careful of those tender balances and tensions that you have between legalism, implying too many rules and, and control, and yet uh, uh, we don't want to have uh, what I call greasy grace where there's no boundaries or standards. So uh, thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for hanging in there all these months. I think it's a testament that we have so many people here this morning. Honestly, when people ask me um, how many people that I thought would come to the church a few weeks ago before we actually announced, I said, I don't know, maybe 20, 30, because when people are scattered, it's hard for them to get back. But I'm so grateful that you're here this morning. And if you're joining us line and you have never received Jesus as your Savior, I just want to briefly explain it to you um, so you have the privilege because this is it's all about Jesus it's all about Jesus Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead so we have three things I call it the ABCs of faith admit a that we are sinners that we can't save ourselves that we're separated from God because of our sin B we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God that he died on the cross his shed blood was shed for our sins, and he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. And the third thing is we confess Christ. In other words, we believe we surrender to him. And that confession is more than verbal. It's our heart. It's surrendering our lives to him. We can't earn salvation because we're not good enough. But we can turn our lives. That means we are now willing to follow Jesus and become a disciple and surrender our lives to him. If you'd like to pray a prayer with me this morning, if you'd like to bow your heads. You're with us, Father, we thank you this morning. And I'm going to pray a prayer for those who would like to receive Jesus. And I'm going to pray it as if I'm receiving Jesus for the very first time. Father, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. And as good as I try to be, I'll never be good enough to earn your approval. But I thank you for the great love with which you have loved me in sending your own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. If I was the only one, he would have still died for me. Shedding his blood for my sins, he was the perfect sacrifice. And praise you, Lord. Praise you for raising him from the dead. Now I ask that you will come into my heart, forgive all my sins. I surrender my life to you. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've received Jesus this morning and you'd like some more information, we'd love to help and encourage you in your faith. Please call the office at 519-438-6005. Uh, you can do that tomorrow, Monday morning or this week. Uh, if no one answers, please leave a message and someone will get back to you. Also, you can email the church at odcf.ca. At odcf God bless you and have a wonderful day.